Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Today, my good co-host, Dale Stenberg, and I have the privilege to talk to Dr. Louis Marcos, who is the professor of English and a scholar in residence at Houston Baptist University. In particular, we wanted to talk about his, uh, his most recent book that just came out this year, uh, From Plato to Christ, How Platonic Thought Shaped the Christian Faith, coming right on the back of a... Uh, a book last year, I think you wrote called "Myth Made Fact" about the the fulfillment of sort of sort of Greco-Roman myth narratives in the in the story of Christ. But uh, maybe one way of opening this up, uh, you, you know, and thanks for being here. <laughs> I should say, I suppose that's the way to start. Uh, but maybe one way to open this up is there was a uh, I read two fun things this week. Uh, one of them was a, a, a tweet from Owen Strachan uh, okay. about uh, uh, about how nerve-wracking it is that that Christians are are uh, especially Baptist Christians are appropriating a kind of philosophical tradition that he thinks is kind of alien to the scriptures and is going to you know and, and in his mind is sort of a contradiction to the Reformation uh, but then I read this book by Lewis Marcos telling us no in fact you should go read Plato and he might even help you become a better Christian uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe one way to kind of get off the the ground here then is to say, What's going on in a debate like that? You know, why is it that Christians are coming to the conclusion, oh, you can't, you can't, don't give much credence, you know, essentially to this philosophical tradition. On the other hand, you need to, uh, wh- how does that debate happen? And, and how do you take the side that you do in it? This is a real problem. And it's one of the things that motivated me to write the book. Okay. If you go back 20 years ago, if you were a liberal Christian and there was something in the Bible or Christianity that you didn't like, but you didn't want to say that. What you did is you blamed it on St. Paul. I only listen to the words in red. Those people always forget that the words in red tell us the most about hell and devils and damnation. And Paul's <laughs> always talking about grace. They kind of forget that. But, but anyway, what I'm seeing, though, in what do you want to call neo-orthodox, neo-evangelicals or whatever, suddenly anything they don't like, they blame on Plato. And the problem is, is that what they're really not liking in Plato is an emphasis on hierarchy, an emphasis on essentialism. Too many of my evangelical, now of course Owen Strachan's not woke at all, okay? But he doesn't realize that the real people that for whom Plato is the enemy are the woke people. The yes. real centered evangelicals need to embrace Plato because he's the one that understands that there are essential truths, the good, the true, and the beautiful. So much of the wokeness is going right back to the great medieval heresy of nominalism. Nominalism means in name only, right? Like a nominal Christian. And and nominalism says that behind the words we use, like good, true, beautiful, justice, there is no absolute form. They're just names that we give. And I'm sorry, nominalism is a heresy, okay? And unfortunately, it influenced some of the uh, reformers. Even Calvin was influenced by these things, right? Uh, and, and we still are fighting against that. And so many American Christians, especially evangelicals, we call ourselves low Protestants, right? Usually that means because we don't have quite as much of a liturgical structure. But it also tends to mean we're suspicious of hierarchy, okay? We don't mind elders, but that's about as far as it goes. And Plato reminds us that, hey, if you don't understand a rightly understood hierarchy, you're not going to understand goodness, you're not going to understand truth, and you're not going to understand beauty. And notice what happens in evangelical circles. The first thing we surrender is beauty. Ah, beauty's all in the eye of the beholder. We don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, imposing our ideas on you. But folks, when you kill or relativize beauty, sooner or later, goodness and truth will fall. And that's starting to happen right now. We no longer understand what justice is. And so we fall prey to Black Lives Matter, which is a Marxist group. Okay, that's just a a simple statement of fact. It doesn't believe that we're made in God's image and therefore have, have essential worth and value. But we are fallen and sinful, and therefore we need salvation, and we need structure, we need limits, and even we need hierarchy. So again, I mean, I love Owen, a great guy, but we're not understanding that Plato's the person that we need right now, not the person that we need to castigate, right? Mm. We need to learn from the general revelation that was revealed to Plato, 
And I believe God very much, the God of the Bible used Socrates, Plato and Aristotle to prepare the pagan world for the coming of Christ. It's all part of Paul's speech in the Areopagus. As your own poets have said, we are his offspring. He could have said, as your own philosophers have said, there is a truth that is absolute and that transcends our world. And so I, I think we cut ourselves off from Plato at great error. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's uh, one, I appreciate the way that you structured the book. It's two parts. Part one is Plato's uh, pre-Christian vision, and then part two is Plato's Christian legacy. Uh, but in the in the in the uh, pre-Christian vision part of the book, you walk through the pre-Socratics. Right. Um, so you, you get into sort of how the world was being prepared, really, for Plato uh, to show <laughs> yeah. up. Uh, there is this tradition of thought that was developing, and then when Plato came along, he sort of pushed the conversation light years in front of where his previous interlocutors were. So it might be helpful to um, just talk briefly about how that that pre that pre Plato line of thinking really finds its uh, apex in Plato. So what was he drawing off of with his master when he was sort of contributing to the thought of Socrates? And, and you mentioned in the book, Socrates just sort of tore everything down, but right. never answered the question. He never gave us a definition of justice. And that sort of frustrated the young Plato and his life mission. And you divide it up into sort of like the, the beginning, middle and end of platonic right. thought. Uh, but set for us the stage, if some of our listeners aren't aware of uh, what was going on culturally in terms of philosophy before Plato comes on the scene and then where he took the conversation mm -hmm. and maybe we'll just sort of move from there into, into right. other things what, you have to say. What, what, what Plato solves is what, what you might call the pre-Socratic riddle. Now we call them pre-Socratic philosophers because they're before Socrates, between 600 and about 450, let's say. They include people like uh, 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 Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Pythagoras, not exactly household names, but pretty big names. They're the ones that are kicking our philosophy. Most of them do not live in Athens. They live either along the Asia Minor coast, today the western coast of Turkey, or they're living along the west or east coast of Italy or on Sicily. Now, when you live on the coast, then you are at a place that is a center of trade. And so new ideas are coming all over the place. And so it makes sense that it begins there. We forget that Athens is actually landlocked. It's got a port mm. called the Piraeus, but it right. itself is actually a little bit landlocked. You have to get down a little ways to get to the port. But anyway, so the pre-Socratics are doing all different things, a lot of which Plato had a fight. I wrote another book called Atheism on Trial and show that a lot of the pre-Socratics and Sophists were, were actually the new atheists of their day, and it took Plato to wrestle with it. That could be another conversation. But for here, out of the pre-Socratics comes a riddle that needs to be solved. What is the nature of reality? Is it one or is it many? Is it singular and unitary or is it pluralistic? Right? So some of them, uh, particularly uh, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, and more famously, a guy named Heraclitus, they said the nature of reality is endless change, pluralism. It's, some, of, some of your listeners may have heard a famous phrase from Heraclitus, you can't step in the same river twice, because mm -hmm. everything is in constant shape, shifting back and forth. You can't really have any really higher standard of truth because everything is shifting shadows and moving around. But then Parmenides, on the other hand, he said the nature of everything is one and unitary. Now, in one sense, that sounds closer to Christian truth, but it has its problems. It borders on what's called monism, the idea that everything is one. And so God and nature, they're all one, all's unified. There is no change. What we think is change is an illusion. And that's kind of the highest version of Hinduism that you get in the Bhagavad Gita and other things and higher versions of Buddhism as well. So what is the nature of reality? Is it plural and changing or is it one and unchanging? And either one of those are problematic. And then along comes Socrates first and then really Plato and they solved the problem. And he was influenced here by Pythagoras. The reason why we have this dichotomy 
is because the nature of reality is twofold, right? As they used to say, beneath the moon, or, so or Solomon would have said beneath the sun, in right. our world of endless change, Plato called it the world of becoming, right? Our world is a world of change and decay and death. Nothing is for certain. The medievals like Dante would say, and starting with Boethius, and then Dante would say, our whole world is overseen by Lady Fortune, the wheel of fortune. Everything changes, everything decays. You can't fully trust your senses because all is in flux. But that's not the whole story. In the heavens, above the moon, we live in a sublunar world. Above the moon was the world of being, where everything is perfect. Everything is now. There is no change or decay. Yes, the spheres are always moving, but they're moving in a perfect circle, which brings perfection rather than decay. The image of the wedding ring of perfection and eternality. Dante imagines the Trinity as three rings interwoven, circles interwoven with one another. So we've got these two worlds. And the role of the philosopher is not to leave the world, but the world of the world of philosopher is to escape from the shifting shadows of our world, we live in the Shadowlands, as Lewis says, last chapter of The Last Battle, to gain a vision of that which does not change, of good with a capital G, truth with a capital T, beauty with a capital B, justice with a capital J, and ultimately look upon the form of the good. Now, Plato called that the beatific vision, which means the blessed vision, and people in the Middle Ages, you know, right on up to Aquinas, talked about the beatific vision, but here's the difference. For Plato, the beatific vision is forever contemplating the form of the forms, but ultimately that form is impersonal. It's perfect and absolute, right. but you can't know it. You can't have a relationship right. with it. But in Christianity, the form of the forms is God, specifically the triune God who has acted in history. But notice what they did. They didn't throw out Plato they transcended Plato to the next level that he could not possibly understand. A perfect, personal, maybe we should say transpersonal, beyond us, God. And the famous uh, philosopher, the, the allegory of the cave, the allegory of the cave is the philosopher who breaks away from the illusions, the imitations of imitations to look upon the form. But here's why Socrates and Plato were heroes for the early church and the medieval church. What does he call the philosopher do? Once you've gained that, that vision, you don't stay in the monastery. Some people may, but most people come back and enter into the world and bring that truth. And sometimes they won't listen to us. Sometimes they will ridicule us. And sometimes, as they did to Socrates, they will be put to death. And I'm yeah, working in a new book in the early church. All the really early church people, I mean, what we call the anti-Nicene, before Augustine, before, before the Council of Nicaea, are always pointing to so Socrates as a hero of someone who stood up for that which is truly true and really real, even though he didn't fully know the God of the Bible because he lacked what we call special revelation. Whew, I'll let you jump right. in there. That's a lot. Well, one of the, <laughs> one of the things you said that I, I found fascinating, I taught a, a community college course uh, uh, maybe two years ago, uh, very kind of a working class community college. And it was interesting, you know, I was introducing them to Plato and, you know, what do you do in community college? Everybody reads the allegory of the cave. Right. If you're so just going to get one thing of Plato. Right. But so I had to read the text very carefully. And it was interesting to me that um, uh, in Plato, the way it's told in the Republic, the, the 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 prisoner who awakens does not just awaken himself. I was actually quite surprised to see that he's sort of awoken. There's almost mm. a, a, a an Augustinian mm. uh, a notion there, and he's almost sort of dragged out of the cave before he sees. It takes the it takes the uh, the philosophical evangelist almost right, of a right. sort to come in and and drag him out to the top, and then he sees and has to go through the conundrum of whether to hang out here and or go back and tell his friends. Uh, uh, but it, it it reminds me, nevertheless, in the book. Um, you know, you use this word inspired and it, and it has, right. and, and you're using it partially because it has a couple of meanings, right? right. Uh, but uh, 
it, it is interesting that, you, you know, Plato can speak about education as a gift of the gods. And, and, and a lot of these early philosophers do think of themselves, it seems like they sometimes talk about themselves as though they're kind of possessed by a daemon of some kind. Like right. they're, they're really are attached. It's not just that they're thinking the right things. It's that it, they're being revealed to almost right. in a particular sort of way. Uh, and I wonder if you can help us work through what, what, what might it mean? You use the word inspired of Plato, I think with a little bit of, uh, there's some playfulness yeah. in the use of the term, I'm sure. But right. I wonder if you could talk about what does it mean to talk about uh, how how did this person, in a sense, like Plato's an exceptional man, how do we account for what, what uh, Providence giving us a person like this? What might it mean to speak of inspired characters like right. this? I mean, it comes down to that essential distinction that's that's even made there in Kalman's Institutes between general revelation and special revelation. Only to you know the ancient Jews, the prophets, the Old and New Testament, Christ, do we have special direct revelation from God. But folks, it's not like God that before Christ came, God only spoke to 1% of the human race and ignored everybody else. Only right. to the Jews did he speak directly. But to the rest of us, it's what's called general revelation. He speaks through creation. He speaks through our conscience. He speaks through our reason. He speaks through our imagination. And the way I like to say it is, okay, Plato may have seen dimly in a dirty mirror, but he saw some. OK, we even the Christians saw dimly in a mirror, but but they're still seeing something, you know, again, because the invisible realm where God, it's not up there. It's all alongside. It's always breaking in. As N.T. Wright likes to remind us, the kingdom of God is always breaking in. And I mean, the best example of of God speaking to a pagan. Remember the story of Balaam, the one whose donkey talked to him. OK, he was moved by God, overpowered to speak a blessing. And it made his the guy who was paying him awfully upset. Uh, yes. he's breaking in. Uh, yeah. Have you ever heard of the Have you ever heard of the hymn of Akhenaten? He was a Egyptian pharaoh who started speaking of the solar disk as if there were one god, and he got in big mm. trouble with the with the priests in power. They didn't like his new idea. Uh, there's even there was even a guy in um, down in Peru amongst the Incas named uh, uh, what's his name uh, 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 Cusco. Uh, not not the emperor's new group, but that same yeah, name. Yeah, the other, the other Cusco. <laughs> yeah. That's the right. other Cusco, yeah, yeah. the real one, who okay. started speaking of, of a god beyond the sun. So he went even farther than the Egyptians in Akhenaten. So there are moments of, and, and actually the best example of a, a non-Jewish, non-Christian person to whom God has given a limited revelation is Melchizedek, right? Yes. Look, yeah. at, look at Genesis. He's not a Jew. And in fact, the name he gives, El El Yod, God Most High, is not really a Hebrew name, but Abraham accepts it and recognizes that the real God is somehow speaking some truth for him. But, right. he, but that doesn't mean Abraham is non-discerning. When the, the men of Sodom want to give him money and all, he's like, no, I want nothing from you all. Right? Yeah. Uh, so some of what I'm talking about is best discussed in a book called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. Um, right. He was a famous missionary, died a few years ago. Um, he wrote The Peace Child as well. But what I'm saying is, is that, yes, God can speak limited truth through these pro pre-Christian people. OK, yes. Uh, you know, when, when, when I'm talking about pagans here, uh, Joseph, I'm not talking about frat boys from, you know, UT Dallas. OK, yeah. I'm, <laughs> talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about the pre-Christian you know, Greeks and Romans. And right. Look, let, let's just. Uh, without sounding somehow ethnocentric, which is the greatest sin, okay? I believe we can find bits and pieces of truth all around the world. We can find yeah. it in a person like Confucius. But we do need to specifically look at the Greeks and Romans, not just because as a Western man, it's our tradition, because that's where God chose to incarnate himself, right? So that doesn't mean that's the only important thing. Right. I hope somebody will read my book who's Chinese and right from Confucius to Christ, okay? We, we, we need to look for the seeds right. because I believe God prepared all the pagan worlds because Jesus is the savior of the world and not right. just the Jewish Messiah, This right? This, this oh, is God. our tradition. God chose this, right? The New yep. Testament was written in Koine Greek, much of which is formed yeah. by people like Plato. So it does need special study because God chose to incarnate in that place. And so there's something important we can borrow from it. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, the two things this reminds me of are 
uh, in addition to um, the book you mentioned, I want to say part of what maybe is behind some of what you're saying is also Wynne Corduan's notion of original monotheism. Right. Uh, and yes. that if you factor that into the kind of history of religion and what's available in various uh, contexts, it it, it, uh, 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 it messes with the calculus a little bit about what we could actually uh, uh, what we could actually say is available. But, but actually, people don't understand there. that evolution is not just something that Darwinians do in biology. Evolution right. is the worldview of the modern world. So we think that everything evolves, even though the Bible and honest anthropologists will show us that you start with monotheism and then you fall away succeedingly into yeah. pantheism, polytheism, and animism. You know, that time, what we're taught, what all people are taught in school is we began as crazy little animists running around and we yeah. worked our way up to <laughs> antheism, polytheism, yeah. monotheism, and then science, of course. Right. But that's not the way things work. The, the nature of reality is not evolutionary. It is, uh, what's the word, entropy. And all the great mythologists from Ovid to Hesiod, if you read it to, to, the, to the Indian writers, they know they have some version of what's called the four ages of man. We start in the golden age and we fall away successively from them. And what Don Richardson found too, is there's plenty of isolated tribes that still have a memory of monotheism, but they yeah. know they've fallen away and they're terrified of the spirits, either the ancestors and the animistic spirits that are holding them in bondage, right? But, yeah. but, but again, that, that's not the way reality works. We are, right. it's moral entropy, not moral evolution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, because this sort of dovetails nicely off of where the conversation is at the moment. Uh, you've got two chapters in the book where it's myths, part one and myths, part two. Hmm. Um, you've also written a previous book on myths and facts. Uh, and C.S. Lewis has also picked up on this uh, and J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, that myths um, can contain uh, truth, even though they're not technically true stories, and how that contributes to the body of knowledge that we all sort of innately grab a hold of and, and revere and hold dear and pass on to generations. We've got myths that have uh, sort of trickled down through history that we all are in tune with because they all say something. So, um, in terms of general revelation, special revelation, what we're talking about with this two-tiered um, cosmology of uh, the, uh, the sublunar realm, which we're in, uh, and the translunar realm, which is where um, the realm of being, uh, how does myth relate to uh, general revelation and our adopting of truth from myth uh, in, re in relationship to our Christian convictions? How does that inform and what should we feel comfortable accepting and what which should we, um, here's what I'm really trying to ask Dr. Marcos. Where are the guardrails that we put up when we talk about myth being fact? And where do we need to lower those guardrails in order for us to accept truth that's coming to us from God via myth? Well, let's start with one of the most important stories in the 20th century. And the origin of my, the title of my other book, The Myth Made Fact, right? C.S. Lewis became a theist about the age of 30 or 31, but he couldn't become a Christian because he knew, because he studied mythology, that all the mythologies around the world had this figure that kept popping up, this sort of God or son of the God who comes to earth, who dies, who rises and is part of the cyclical season, you know, the four seasons, what we don't have in, in uh, Houston and only barely have in Dallas. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so you can call him Osiris, you can call him Adonis, you can call him Tammuz or Mithras or, or Krishna or Balder or whatever it is. And Lewis said, well, you know, so Jesus is just the Hebrew version of this age old myth. Why do I have to understand? What does it mean to me? And one day when Lewis was 32 years old, he was walking along the grounds of Magdalen College, Oxford, a place called Addison's Walk. And as he walked around and around with his good friend, Gerard Tolkien, a very strong believing Catholic, uh, author of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien said to Lewis, you know what, Jack, his nickname, what if the reason that Jesus sounds like a myth is because he's the myth that became fact, the myth that was saying true? Why is it that all across the globe, People have these same arch 
archetypal myths? Where is it coming from? Why do we all sense this need for a bridging between the human and divine, an understanding of the cycles of life, death, and rebirth? Where does it come from? Well, if we're all made in the image of the same God, there's lots of evidence for that, then that God has written that in the hearts of all men, right? For God has written eternity in the hearts of men, it says in Ecclesiastes. And now look, that written in our heart, that general revelation, it manifests itself in all these different myths, but it doesn't have special revelation, so it goes awry. Sometimes it gets really bloody. Sometimes it becomes sort of taboo-like, all these different things, and yet we keep having this yearning. Now, along comes Jesus. Christians believe that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament law and prophets. But if that is all that Jesus did, then he was only the Jewish Messiah and not the savior of the world. But he not only fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, he fulfilled all the highest yearnings and myths and desires of the pagan people. But whereas yeah. all those other stories have only a mythic, in other words, they're not historical. The story of Jesus, while continuing to be mythic, is historical. It happened in real time and place under Pontius Pilate. It wasn't a story of eternal recurrence. It was an actual moment in history when the tomb was empty and the resurrected Jesus appeared to the disciples and turned a bunch of scared rabbits into these fearless crusaders, most of whom died for their faith. So, yes. but let's wrap it up here. Okay, so Lewis says that Jesus is more than Balder, right? That's the uh, that's the uh, corn king of the, corn the king, yeah. Uh, he's the corn king of the Norsemen who was killed by a bad guy from the MC universe. Okay, so uh, yeah. look, uh, <laughs> anyway, so Lewis says so. Yes, Jesus is more than Balder because he's real and historical, but he's not less than Balder. So in other words, he is real and true and historical, but he is still mythic in the sense that he speaks to our deepest needs and yearnings, things that were written upon us. Oh, Lord, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Right. The opening part of, mm -hmm. of Augustine's confessions. So in myth, we're, we're because, look, science is great. Reason is great. Logic is great, but it can only go so far. If we are going to shatter the barrier between the visible and invisible world, we often need something that's not irrational, but that is a that transcends the rational, that speaks to us in this direct, intuitive way. Folks, obviously, I'm very conservative, but a lot of conservatives, we are too quick to make a saint out of John Locke. Now, John Locke offered a lot of great ideas that influence our founding fathers. I'm very thankful for a lot of the things he did. But we have to be careful what we get from him. Because John Locke is this person who said, we are blank slates, tabula rasa, white sheep. We're born absolutely empty. There is no such thing as any kind of innate or intuitive uh, knowledge. Right. Well, that's just false from a Judeo-Christian point of view. God has written eternity in our hearts. Okay, We, we come you know, from God and we have... That desire, we are a homo religiosus, religious man. And so it's wrong. We are not blank slates who only learn things from our senses. We learn from intuition as well. Now, right. Plato said the reason why the, the reason why the truth is already there and we need to access it by means of the uh, Socratic dialogue or what he called the dialectic is because we come born with a lot of this knowledge. Now, Plato theorized that our soul existed in heaven before we were born. Now, I would call that an abiblical idea. Reincarnation is completely unbiblical. But to say that our soul existed briefly before it entered our body, and so that our soul has some kind of memory of heaven, I think that's possible. I would never put that in a doctrine because it's not clear enough in the Bible. Right. But folks, let, let me end with this and I'll turn it back to you. Okay, whether or not our soul pre-existed, okay, what a lot of all theologians, but especially the Calvinists, they love to say in Adam's fall, we sinned all. And we all believe it, whether Catholic or not, original sin, that 
we participate in the sin of Adam. Any believing Christian, whether they call it original sin, total depravity, whatever. But, folks, if we participate in the sin of Adam, then we must also participate in that brief play time when he was in the Garden of Eden. And I believe that we all have an antenatal, prenatal memory of Eden. And I believe that that's part of where that yearning and longing comes from. And right. we access that best, not by reasoned discourse, but by myth and intuition that leaps beyond to other realities that even reason, because what, what is it? But the heart hath reasons that reason knows nothing about, Pascal said. But I think it's even deeper than that. Yeah. Wow, that's not I, it's, it's interesting because you, you, a lot of Plato gets a bad rap because they think that he's um, discrediting the poets and the artists because they're just making sh copies of the copy, right? Uh, but one thing that you show is Plato actually pulls out most of his genius in yes. myth. Uh, so maybe that could be, uh, talk briefly to us yes. about how, how Plato's employing myth in the dialogues in order to prove his overall thesis of this world of uh, uh, being and the world of becoming. So the world of forms and that, so, cause that was in the book that just lends itself to more conversation, I think. So uh, first let, let's exonerate Plato a little bit here because we read the Republic. First of all, the whole point of the Republic is to figure out what justice is. It's not really about creating a utopia. The trouble is if we're trying to find justice in the human soul, the soul is invisible. You can't see it, smell it, taste it, touch it. How can you find it in the soul? So what he decides to do is take the microcosm of the soul and expand it onto a microcosm. Let's create the perfect state and then we can work our way back. If we can find justice in the macrocosm of the Republic, then maybe we can work our way backwards mm. and find it in the microcosm of the soul. And he just gets carried away. Okay, but yes, there is censorship there, but we need to understand what this censorship is. This is because people are reading Plato as philosophically and theologically true. And if the gods are like Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Athena, then we're in big trouble because those gods, they, they cannot be a standard for anything. Plato is moving towards monotheism, not necessarily because he's getting, you know, Jehovah or something, Yahweh. It's because he realizes that if there is a God, that God must be the standard of goodness, truth, holiness, perfection. He's moving close to it. He's not there, but I think it's wholly okay to use a capital G sometimes uh, it, with Plato because he's moving towards the idea of a single God who in the Timaeus actually is a creator God. Okay, So this is not about censorship because everything's evil. It's because we can't have a sin. Look, in the book of Acts, a group of people get together and burn books. Yes, it acts. They're not burning Homer. They're not burning Plato. They're burning literally books of spells with demonic spells about how to put curses on people. That's what they're getting rid of. Okay, so we, we need to understand what's going now. Yes, he kicked the poets out of the Republic because he said poets are only dealing with imitations of imitations. But guess what? Plato was one of the greatest poets of all time. He started, and it's like Paul. How many times does Paul give us a nice reasoned discourse that makes Calvinists happy for the whole day, and then all of a sudden he <laughs> loses himself in a doxology? Oh, the what? And it's poetry. He loses himself in poetry. Almost all of Jesus's teaching is in the form of Hebrew parallelism, which is Hebrew poetry, right? But it's like Plato goes so far, and then he makes a leap, an intuitive leap, to create a myth. And most of his myths, most of his myths are either about origins or endings. They're either about why things are the way they are or about judgment and the last day and how we prepare because life is partly a preparation for death. But he just, to really get at the truth, he needs to leap into the mythic realm. And what's wonderful is all of his best dialogues end with a myth. The Gorgias, the Republic, the Timaeus, the Phaedrus, the Phaedo, the Gorgias, almost all of them, what we call his middle dialogues, generally lose themselves in a myth that incarnates the truth. See, one of the things that Socrates and Plato did, they invented modern philosophy because they combined metaphysics and ethics. 
too often they're kept separate, right? Either you're a, 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 an ethical philosopher or you're like a religious sacramentalist, but they don't come together. In Plato and Socrates, they come together. What you believe should influence directly how you behave and you can't keep them separate. You can't be a pagan who's very religious, but very immoral or a magi who is very, very moral, but is not religious and laughs at the religious people. So you see how they came together perfectly in Christ, but they've already come together in Plato. And if Plato is going to speak to the whole person, he needs to, and he always ends with the myth. He like leaves us hanging there. He doesn't even come back and interpret it for us. He kind of leaves yes. it hanging. And it it's, as if it's just self-evident. Yeah, right. And that's a good way to put it. It speaks. And by the way, a really good writer, Catholic writer, is Joseph Pieper. You know that yes. name? Yeah. Not Piper, it's pronounced Pieper. Leisure as the Basis of Culture is his best-known book. But he also wrote a book about Plato's myths and other short books mm. about Plato uh, that are very, yeah. very, very good and worth reading. It's as I was listening to you speak, I was thinking a little bit about the theme of persuasion. And it is interesting. And Plato actually does have, um, Plato has this interesting argument. And I, I can't remember exactly which dialogue it's in, but he's sort of, he's sort of defending the notion that there is something to this, this idea that to know is to remember. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, in fact, that it, it's interesting to see that in real moments of persuaded in our own lives, we're all reasonable people here, read philosophy or whatever. Uh, but as you think about the moments where you've actually gone, aha, it's not usually merely a deduction to an argument. It's more like a synoptic it's a synoptic patterned relationship between a whole parts that sort of becomes a hole in your head that you then just can't unsee once you see it. Right. And it seems like the parable, the myth has the capacity to kind of give that synoptic relationship between things, both in their temporal and structural dimensions. Think uh, about and, Einstein. E equals MC squared is something that just came to him. And he spent the rest of his life trying to prove it. And as I understand yes. it, it wasn't fully proven until uh, they used uh, an eclipse of the moon and stuff like that. All the bending of light. But it's look, my definition for I'm thinking of myself now as a writer, as an artist, the way I like to define uh, inspiration on the human level is that my job as a writer is I need to study and read and get all of that stuff in my head. But the inspiration from the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean I'm writing the Bible, but the inspiration is that moment when God smacks you and a new synthesis is formed. Kind of what you're saying, the synapse, uh, Joseph. Yeah. Suddenly, I'm seeing it, and then I'm spending the next year writing it down. Okay, but and I think a lot of you know the famous story that um, uh, Thomas Aquinas wrote, the Great Summa Theologica, all that sort of stuff. And then near the end of his life, he had a sudden mystical encounter with God, and he said, next to that. Everything I've written so far is strong. Yeah. You heard yeah. that story? This yeah. is wild. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. One other thing I was going to say that, uh, uh, and, and maybe I'll, 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 I'll add a question onto this because it is it is quite relevant even to this. But going back to um, uh, kind of the prepara the preparation for the gospel, one thing that's Lewis, uh, one thing that Lewis is interesting in until in we have faces, I think, is that one could read till we have faces as almost like a Lewis imagining a myth developing in a local Norwegian right. town that yeah. you can kind of see developing in the direction of a kind of figure. But it's, right. it is fascinating that you know, a lot of missionaries and Don Richardson's one of them, it seems right. like they go into these other nations uh, and Bovink anticipates this. Bovink anticipates that when Christianity gets to China, that the Chinese will not experience Christ, and we've said this on the podcast before, but that the Chinese will not experience Christ as uh, the kind of uh, uh, get the, the guy who gets rid of everything that's Chinese. They'll rather experience him as, as the Lord who summons their Chineseness, as it were, uh, within which being yes. Chinese and the whole tradition uh, that is Chinese comes to fruition. Only repentant, only sin is required to be repented of, not not creation. But yeah, right. it seems like it seems like there's a yeah, there's a lot to uh, that that model, it seems is is correct to me. But it, it, here's an objection somebody could throw out. I just wonder how you respond to it. You know, on the one hand, we could see Plato is kind of preparing the way for Christ and the gospel sort of goes where Plato could not. 
But I think some would want to say, aren't there also um, corrections to Plato in the gospel right. tradition? So one, and the obvious example here is the incarnation. In a platonic in a platonic metaphysic, would you ever expect something like the incarnation? Or is that sort of, so in other words, maybe this is that, right. I, we don't need to get into that particular instance necessarily, but could we also speak of uh, the Christian tradition as uh, having correctives for the right. for the Greek philosophical tradition? Uh, so fact, you, you know, I mean, like I said, as you know, you, oftentimes it's the publisher that comes up with subtitles and they gave it yes. how platonic <laughs> thought shaped the Christian faith. I probably would have said something more like how the Christian faith fulfilled Platonism. I mean, I'm okay with it. Ah, but but yes. you know, it, 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 unfortunately, that subtitle could be used by critics to say, "Aha, I got you," or or even by liberal critics, "Aha, Jesus is only Mithras," you know, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But the the um, uh, I forgot what I was saying. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we were talking about the, the corrective. Does Christianity oh, yeah, correct? Yeah, thank yeah. You. Okay, I mean, yeah, the, the one thing, that, not one thing, the most important thing that Plato could not understand without general revelation is that God would ever take on human flesh. I mean, again, now, now a lot of that super Gnosticism that says the flesh is evil, that's coming more out of Neoplatonism than it is out of Platonism. Right. I would argue it's a little bit of a corruption of that with Plotinus and Porphyry and things like that. Now, but still, you know, so so that Lewis can agree with Plato that we're living in the shadow lands, but Lewis is still going to be more positive. Lewis is not going to say this. This is just illusion and nothing else. He's going to say compared to the thundering reality of heaven, this is like a shadow land. An example, when Jesus says, unless you hate your mother and father, you cannot follow me. Now, obviously, Jesus cannot be using that in a simply literal fashion because he would be going against the commandment to honor thy father and mother. It right. seems that our love and commitment to God should be so great and so pure that in relationship to that, it would be as if we hated our mother and father. So right. th th this is a corrective. This is going to be a corrective uh, that Lewis is going to use as well on Plato. But again, Plato's just not going to understand. See, Again, it is true that ultimately for Plato and actually for a whole lot of Americans who don't know any better, our soul is trapped in our body and salvation means the soul escaping the prison house of the body. Today, we call that dualism. And a lot of people who are Christians and go to church still think that yes. when we die, we become <laughs> angels, right? right? One of my yeah, favorite right. movies, It's a Wonderful Life. Great movie, very bad theology, okay? Yes. We don't become angels. Now, it is true that if we die today, we will be whatever disembodied for a period. But our final goal is to have a resurrection body like Jesus says, except ours won't have any scars. Right. So that's a misunderstanding that people still have today. We st a lot of Americans still think, but soul, good body, bad. Do you know what shocked people about Psycho, the movie Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock? It wasn't just the killing. That movie was the first time a toilet bowl was seen in a movie. Right. Because the two mm. things that Americans are embarrassed by is sex and the bathroom. Now, what do they have in common? <laughs> They're physically bodily things. And a lot of Americans are still right. When, 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 a, um, when a British person says, where's the toilet? We get all bent out of shape. I don't know if you notice that. OK, where, where's so the restroom, is, actually, Mr. Yes. British man? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Right. That, that's right. Yeah. And, and the, the Canadians say washroom, which is even sillier. But the uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, it's kind of a strange sort of stuff. So but but. Here's the crazy thing about this. Okay, so yes, Plato cannot understand a redeemed body. That's why when Paul spoke at the Areopagus, they listened very carefully, those Stoics and Epicureans. But when he said that, that you know, God sent a man by which he'll judge the world, and he gave proof of it by raising him from the dead, they're like, whoa, whoa, why, did, why would anybody want their body back? Okay, so there is something pretty amazing here, right? Pretty yeah. amazing. Um, but here's the crazy thing. Okay. During the Middle Ages, Greek was basically lost as a language. Now, over in Byzantium, all of antiquity was still there. But in the Latin West, the Latin Catholic West, right. even, even uh, Augustine knew very little Greek and actually didn't even particularly like it. He hated it. He only liked Latin. Um, so, okay, so what happened was Plato was basically lost. All they had of Plato was one Latin translation of the Timaeus. Now, God, it's amazing. 
of all the things, even even the, the Repub now, when I say Plato's lost, it's still there through Boethius and through Virgil. And, you know, so it's still there. But I mean, d- direct contact with Plato is lost in the West for quite a long time. But isn't it amazing? The one dialogue that is the Timaeus. Look, the Timaeus is the only book in the ancient world that comes within 100 miles of creation ex nihilo, that God created the world. Now, he doesn't say that. But he's that's the only ancient book that comes anywhere near this idea that there's a creator that seems to be separate from his creation. And basically, he thinks the creation is good. He doesn't envy the creation. He creates the angels whose bodies are so pure, they're almost eternal. So, so again, and, and, and yeah. if, if you want proof to, to, so you can see it visually that Timaeus was the book of Plato in the school of Athens by Raphael, the famous fresco. At the center are Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle's holding a book that says ethics, his Nicomachean ethics, the most important of his books for the Middle Ages. Plato's holding a book that says, not Republic, it says Timaeus, Timaeus. So Mm. that was the book. That was the book that Plato had access to, that others. It's pretty clear when you read the the city of God. The only Plato that he he actually uh, directly quotes is the Timaeus, right? Mm. So, you know, God has a sense of humor. God plans to give us this incredible, incredible book, uh, dialogue, yeah. the Timaeus. It even has a little bit of the Atlanta story in it, which is kind of neat. Mm. <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, I appreciate your energy and conversation, brother, because we yes. could be on the, we, we could actually be on this call for five hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, but we have to sort of uh, bring it in for a closing here. And I want to, I want to say, or I want to ask this, because I think that this was one of your more, um, well, for me anyway, this was one of the more uh, relieving tones that you took in the book is that you're very interested in the practical, how does this cash out in the mm. Christian life? And I hope it's okay if I read your very yeah. last sentence of, yeah. of the book. Uh, but you say, for myself, I can attest that reading Plato has made me want to be a better man, a better teacher, and a better Christian to ascend the rising path and so find my true telos, the higher purpose for which I was born. So I wanted to make one comment and then I'll ask you a a question. And then Joe, if you've got anything, we'll Mm. we'll wrap up. Um, I was telling Joe, Joe teaches a course. uh, um, What's the name of the course, brother? The technical name of the course for Davin at Hall. Oh, oh, uh, uh, philosophy of modernity or philosophy for theology? For philosophy for theology. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so I've gone through both of his courses, um, and we are really studying the classical tr- tradition, uh, which comes from you know Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and down through Aquinas and then all the way through the Protestant Reformation, and working through that material and thinking carefully about all of these things. Uh, it really has given me the deepest assurance, not only in my faith in Jesus, but to um, unify a thought that encompasses all of reality rather than just the salvation of my soul. Uh, God's interested in much more. He's primarily interested in saving my soul, but he's interested in the redemption of the cosmos that he's created. And all of these things, because of who God is, relate to one another in a perfect harmony uh, that sings. And you, and you almost have to, like Lewis says, you almost have to block it out in order not to feel it. Uh, So the move for most unbelievers is not that they're just not convinced by what they see. It's that they have to actually blind themselves to all of the things penetrating their consciousness that screams to this higher reality. And Plato has has seemed uh, to tap into that in a way that nobody uh, before him uh, had done and very few people after him have done uh, other than our, you know, apostles. But my question is, when I talk to my mother, my mom is 50. Well, I won't say how old my mom is. actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, when I talk to my mom and my dad um, and they're like, well, like, what is what, what is philosophy? What is Plato? What is Socrates and Aristotle and all of this stuff? What how is that going to help me love Jesus more? Uh, it seems like you're a man who has walked carefully through the Platonic tradition 
and it has made you love your G your Lord more. Right. So tell me why, what has he contributed? What does this mean? How does this cash out in the pews on Sunday morning? If we're going to encourage people to read Plato, to get involved in studying philosophy at some level, even if it's just an introductory level, mm -hmm. um, then why? First of all, you will be happy to know that the original title of my book was From Plato to Christ, colon, Ascending the Rising Path. That was my original title. And it's a cool title they gave me, right? Yeah. Um, a little, little more uh, practical, whatever. But yeah. it's about ascending the rising path. It is about moving closer and closer to Christ. Uh, that beautiful hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I think Plato would agree with that. What's wonderful is if you want to grow spiritually, instead of putting all of your focus on getting rid of that sin and getting rid of that sin and getting rid of that sin, if we keep our eyes focused on the light, okay, if we're the philosopher coming out of the cave, as we draw closer and closer to the light, those old sins are not going to be pleasant anymore they're, they're not going to be attractive uh, what is the end of uh, the the end of um, uh, the screw tape letters and as he comes closer he says you know that would be like the the, the 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 lure of a rattled old harlot next to his true love that has come back and is waiting for him right so yes fall in love with the light i'll give you an example and it's really funny because i grew up greek orthodox uh and and now not because i'm baptist i don't want to sound legalistic but I don't drink, okay? And I'm, I'm fine with drinking Jesus drink. But the reason I didn't, okay? And I not only don't drink alcohol, I don't drink coffee. And the reason I never started drinking coffee was because I was kind of a young Platonist. I don't think I was a break, maybe I was. But I was a young Platonist. And whenever I heard adults say, I can't, uh, you know, survive in the morning without my cup of coffee. I thought, what? I thought being an adult meant being free not being bound by this and needing this and needing that. And it was because I was reading a lot of Plato, even, even as, as a fairly young kid. Like, I don't want something that controls me. Now, as you can tell, I'm already of a sanguine nature, so I don't really need it. Okay? <laughs> Other people of a, you know, of a more morose, you know, I, I think they, you know, they think it's that wine that gladdens the heart. So I'm not against wine. But what I'm saying is, is that, you know, I, I, I don't want something that is controlling me, except, of course, Christ, right? Uh, and Plato is showing me a, a life of discipline, but it's a life of joy because the mm. discipline is not an end in itself, like in legalism. It is, it is like the athlete who, by practicing, can actually run the marathon or jump super high or throw the javelin or whatever. Mm. So it, it, it is a discipline that leads to greater and greater love. Now, I'm a Baptist, so I don't. I wouldn't say I believe in purgatory, okay? But if you're a Dante scholar like I am, you have to you have to take it somewhat seriously, right? And, and yeah. to try to explain that to, to, to my fellow Baptists, you know, the soul wants purgatory. And I'll just give you a quick example. Okay, let's say Joe and I are about to get an all expense paid trip to Italy, to Rome, Italy. Right. And it's going to happen in four months. Right. It's been given to us. It's pure grace. We haven't worked for it. But for the next four months, the next four weeks, Joe just sits around and does whatever he wants. I check out a hundred books on Rome from the library. I read, I study all of it. When we get to Rome, who is going to have more joy in Rome? It's going to be me because I've open my eyes to recognize the wonders that are there. So it's beyond legalism. It's what is going to prepare you for a closer relationship, a greater understanding. It's ultimately about joy and desire, as it is in Augustine, as it is in Dante, as it is in C.S. Lewis. These are some of the great, as it is in, in, uh, in, in G.K. Chesterton. Some of the people where joy is so important and it's what's propelling you forward. And so, yes, I want to keep ascending out of that, you know, world of shadows. I want to yeah. see what's really real and truly true. And Plato can be a guide as he was for the, like I said, when I say the early Christian, I'm talking about early apologists like Justin Marler and a lot of people wouldn't even read today. These early Tertullian people that are before uh, the Nicene uh, thing. 
Tertullian, uh, another one is named Irenaeus. Some of these people, when you read them, the early apologists, they made a connection uh, to the people of their time. They talked about the logos, but they also talked about ascending the rising path. Mm. Amen, brother. Mm. Yeah. Anything else, Joe? No, no, not uh, well. I might just add one one other thing that I think is fascinating in Plato that you don't find in a lot of. Um, uh, uh, you point this out, I think, Doctor Marcos, but uh, just the very fact that he's writing in dialogue is very, very fascinating. That that we I used this phrase earlier, a synoptic truth is a kind of synoptic. You see a lot coming together, uh, and dialogue is so conducive to that. And in fact, Drew Johnson in his recent book on biblical philosophy, kind of makes the point that this is something like this, a more maybe polyphonic voiced uh, uh, way of getting at something is a very Hebrew way to think. And yet yes. in Plato, uh, in Plato, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's fascinating to me that he thinks in dialogue and that truth is arrived at through kind of, through, through that kind of dialectic, as opposed to what is just most philosophical prose that we've ever read, which is just me talking, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And I just, I think that's fascinating and Christians have a lot to, I don't know, a lot to learn. There's philosophical insight in, in thinking that's the method even. Uh, I mean, yeah. You're right that we normally think of Hebraic versus Hellenic. Matthew Arnold and others have popularized that. And there's some truth to that. But yeah. Again, you know, let's just put it this way. If you really want to understand the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, you would best to avoid the, the American university and look at the sensei, you know, when, when you're learning yes. martial arts. Yes. It's actually closer to yes, learning right. at the feet of. And, and, and I still really laugh because my father doesn't really come from a Christian background and he certainly doesn't understand the way Baptists talk. And I'll never forget, I was speaking at a place. My, my parents live in Florida, by the way, Dale, Tarpon Springs near Tampa, ah. Florida. Greek sponsors. Ah, yes. Yeah, I go yeah, there yeah. a lot. Um, and, and one time we were speaking, and this man said to my father, I have so enjoyed learning at your son's feet. And he's just like, oh. well, uh, yeah. And he, was just, he was just like, so, well, you know what to do? Because that, that is a pretty weird phrase. You know, I mean, yes. like, like, for instance, um, when I was, I grew up Greek Orthodox. And we, you know, we used to sing, you know, we gathered, we gathered together to ask the Lord's blessing on Thanksgiving. And it ends with sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. And that confused me as a kid. Of course, God doesn't forget his own name. You think he's an idiot? I had no concept of the sort of Protestant idea of his own, his people, you know, his chosen mm-hmm. people. So uh, some, some of these yeah. things are funny. But, but yes, I mean, the relationship between Plato and his pupils or his disciples is a little bit like that between Jesus and his. And you know what? And we could spend this right. But there is a link of Eros there. Now, that really scares us because Eros, yeah. erotic, you know, we're talking about pederastic. We're not talking about Eros as as love as a desire for knowledge right and there is a right. real kind of eros there again very much rightly understood uh but we see that in the relationship between jesus and his disciples and the way he invests in just you know a dozen disciples yeah. please please let us remember if you're a preacher listening to this stop being an american who thinks the only way you know you're being a true man of God is if your church ends up with 2,000 people in it. Right. Okay? We Amen. have to get away from this quantity notion of statistics that we have here uh, and realize that if statistics shows a good preacher, then Jesus did an awful job. He only had 12, <laughs> yeah. right? One of them right. betrayed him. The other ran away, okay? He had, he yeah. had more followers, but when he said that about eating my blood and drink, drinking my blood, they, they all left, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, That's so, right. You know, I mean, if, if, if we start, I mean, Plato will help us understand what we would call quality over quantity, mm-hmm. right? That we, yeah. we need to grow and we need to. And I, I think you were saying something about it before, Dale. Uh, of course, I don't believe this literally, but there's a beautiful metaphor. Pythagoras did believe it in reincarnation. That's where the word works. That's where Plato got it from. But notice Plato only talks about reincarnation in his myths. So he may not really believe it. Never comes anywhere except in his myth. But anyway, Pythagoras, it's a beautiful metaphor, not true literally, but a metaphor for the Christian. For that, you will keep coming back again and again until your soul has come into such a perfect harmony that you actually hear the music of the spheres. That's the music the universe sings. Mm. And then you depart and you become part of it. Now, of course, literally a Christian can we don't, we don't accept that. But isn't that wonderful to reach such a beautiful. sense of harmony? 
that, mm. you know, that you can sort of step into heaven and it could be an extension. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we grow that way. And again, yes. Plato can be a help in that kind of growth. Mm. Yep. Order the affections, uh, live a virtuous life. All will go well for you. And we'll get big mansions on the new earth, brother. <laughs> but I hope mine's right next to you because, yeah, we could just hang out all day. A good way to end is, you know, when I was younger, finally evangelicals were understanding the meta narrative, the sacred narrative. But at first, all they said was creation, fall, redemption. Now they know better. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and even glorification. What yeah. the Greeks call theosis. So, because you were saying that before, Dale, it used to be only about salvation. Now it is about a restored heaven mm. and earth. One of my Amen. favorite verses in the Bible is that God will restore even what the locusts have devoured. Yes. Mm. We need a little yes. bit of that, right? If you've been through some yeah. kind of heartache or whatever, that there will be a not just salvation, but complete restoration. So that in a sense, mm. nothing is wasted. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's our hope. That's our hope Amen. as Christians. And it's a good hope. So, well, Dr. Marcos, thank you so much, brother. Yes, uh, thank you. We have, have to do this again. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. you, you have been the sensei, and we've been <laughs> thank you this, <laughs> this week. So, and keep it, and uh, I'm going to say, happy to you guys. You, I think you guys are going to keep your hair. I'm just looking at you. you know? <laughs> when I was your age, it was very clear it was going away. So you guys oh, you yeah. may hold on to that hair. So that's pretty Thank good. You. We'll see. My, my dad's 63, still got a full head. I think I've, it's, okay, that's it's good. genetic. Yeah. Uh, so everyone pick up the book, From Plato to Christ by uh, Dr. Lewis Marcos. Uh, this has been just a fantastic conversation. Yeah. We'll look forward Great. to doing it again. Um, but as always, you can head over to our Davenant Institute uh, YouTube channel and check out all the previous episodes of Pilgrim Faith uh, and Lord willing, all the future ones. We also have a Facebook page and a Facebook group if you want to get into the conversation. So look us up. Uh, but until next time, Joe, I love you, brother. Love you too, man. Dr. Marcos, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. All blessings. And until next time, guys. All right. See you.